Hello, I'm Asif Farouk of Finextra, and we're here today with Colin Adams and Leo Lippis of Lippis Advisors. So firstly, thank you both for joining me today. Um, you've co-written a paper for the Swift Institute entitled Cross-Border Low-Value Payments and Regional Integration Enablers and Disablers. Colin, my first question to you is, in the course of your research, you looked at nine different payments projects. How do they compare? Well, despite the differences we saw in these different regional uh, payment projects, there were a number of common features we saw in all or most of them. So the first one is having a targeted scope and not trying to migrate all payment products to a regional scheme at once, focusing instead uh, on for low value ACH payments as they did in SEPA. The next feature we saw was um, a common data standard and that's very integral to allowing the different stakeholders in the market to actually communicate with each other. Related to that is the existence of a common scheme, so a set of rules for business and technical rules that uh, enable true interoperability uh, between all the different countries and stakeholders. The other feature we saw was uh, the existence of a common currency for settlement, whether that's the currency of a domestic system or a third currency, as well as a single settlement system to actually settle the regional transactions. And the last thing that we noticed was uh, a very important prerequisite is the existence of a modern domestic payment system before trying to pursue a regional payment scheme. So Leo, how do you define success for a regional payment scheme? Well, in looking at, uh, at these nine different systems in the study, we, we defined a number of different criteria. The first and probably the most important one is establishing a centralized governance structure to align the, the, uh, the interests of the various stakeholders in any kind of regional integration project um, and ensure that decisions are taken in a centralized, organized manner and enforced rather than allowing the proliferation of implementations as, they sort of, as it bleeds out toward the periphery. The second most important one is, is potentially uh, uh, um, implementing common standards. Colin has already talked about that in his first question and, and the importance of standards. Third is ensuring that the solution being put into place is more cost efficient than the existing rails for, for, for sending cross-border payments. Um, of course, when we're, when we're creating a system to regionalize payments that, that, that's displacing an existing system, the new one has to in fact be more efficient than the old one. Next is increasing the membership within that system, whether the membership applies to countries, whether it applies to uh, banks, uh, or any other kinds of entities in, in, in within the payment system. You have to ensure that that membership reaches a critical mass so that it's able to drive volume. And then the next factor is, of course, driving that volume into the system. And last but not least, I think it's important to mention that any kind of regional integration, or at least the most successful ones, are almost always linked to a, an important political goal. And that varies from system, system to system. In some cases, it's about political in integration. In others, it's about financial inclusion. In others, yet, it's about facilitating or promoting cross-border trade. But having that linkage to a political goal and the support of the, of the relevant governments involved is, 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 also, is also very, very important. Uh, so, Colin, what role does standards play in the success of a regional payments integration project? Well, having a common data standard is absolutely integral to the success of any regional payments project. And it's often one of the first steps pursued by stakeholders looking to uh, integrate domestic payment systems. There are two main data standards that we saw in multiple uh, projects around the world. The first one's ISO 20022, which has gained wider acceptance in recent years, for example, in SEPA or in the Southern African Development Community. ISO 20022 has the advantage of being a modern, flexible standard that's also politically neutral, which can be very important when bringing together different countries in a regional scheme. The other standard that we saw, uh, particularly in Western and Eastern Africa, were SWIFT MT series. Uh, SWIFT has played a big role in uh, helping modernize uh, domestic payment systems in those countries, and the banks uh, in, the, in those regions already have familiarity with the MT messages for both high value payments and for cross-border payments. So they see that sometimes as a natural uh, fit when moving to a regional scheme. Um, okay, so Colin, what surprised you during the course of your research? Well, I was surprised at just how ambitious some of these projects actually are. If we take the International Payments Framework Association, for example, which is a loose collection of payments processors and banks, that have defined common standards to enable uh, automated uh, exchange of cross-border payments um, with global ambitions. Um, Andy, I'll ask the same question to you. Was there anything that surprised you during the course of the research? What really surprised me was how difficult it was to establish the criteria for success across these nine different systems. Given how different their goals are, given how 
different their ambitions are, it was really hard to pin it down to a number of common factors among them and really try to determine which ones were succeeding, which ones were, which ones were not.